Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this month's Couch Coding Composer Workflow. Your experts for today are Pantheon co-founders Matt Cheney and David Strauss. Just a few housekeeping items to go over before we start. Please make sure you submit any questions you have during the presentation in the question window. We want to answer as many of your questions during the presentation as possible, so keep them coming. Also, the webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be made available to everyone next week. I'd now like to turn it over to Matt and David. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another fabulous episode of Couch Coding um, on this uh, illustrious day here in April. We're um, hoping the folks uh, who learn about Composer don't have a lot of uh, flashbacks to being forced to play piano when they were younger, uh, and instead are looking forward to doing good development practices for their WordPress and Drupal sites. Um, are you as psyched about this as I am, David? I am. It's all about building developer support and a community at the grassroots. And uh, um, I guess we'll be kicking things off with um, uh, some automation uh, workflows around Composer, because ultimately Composer is about automation. That's right. It's definitely a, a, definitely a, a power tool. And one of the things I think that you know, we at Pantheon, having been doing this for a while, have very much seen a sort of increase, uh, like a ramp up kind of effect with, uh, with Composer. That, you know, six years ago, uh, when we started Pantheon, some people maybe were playing around with some kind of dependency management tools. But over the last six years, we've really seen this PHP renaissance, where um, aside from a bunch of stuffy music, we also have a you know, bunch of really great tools for managing the like, wider ecosystem of uh, PHP projects. And Composer has become not just in so many cases sort of like thing on the side, but like a central part of, of, ever, of a lot of websites' workflows. And this is true for, uh, certainly for Drupal 8 sites, Composer is sort of a requirement in many ways to use Drupal 8 but also for you know, advanced WordPress sites and also Drupal, Drupal 7 um, and below sites. Uh, I think just to give people who maybe joined in a sort of you know, quick overview of what Composer is, it is a dependency manager for PHP. It's sort of like our, our lifeline to get off of the different CMS islands we're on to uh, connect to other you know, communities and projects that may be helpful to building web applications. And a successor in purpose uh, to the classic tool Drush Make, Drush Make. Uh, which has been popular in the Drupal community for years for, for the ability to specify the exact modules you want to pull down, <clears throat> the version constraints of them, and then ultimately uh, deploy a site or share a project that is built on top of that defined specification rather than every single file being um, directly managed as, as part of the code base. Yeah. Because like on some level, not all levels, but certainly today, a lot of developers are lazy and are looking to include other people's code as part of their project. Why write code that you need, that someone else has already done? Um, you know, why not just use their code or maybe do a you know, sort of quick patch or improvement to it to use it? And Composer is really the solution to like, how do you manage all the code that's out there for your project, not just the sort of core CMS that if you're running on Pantheon, every time a WordPress or Drupal update comes out, you get a little box that says click here to update. That will manage the like core system. But you know, for your plugins or your modules, like those have to be managed in a separate way. And Drupal and WordPress have ways to update those as well, which is a separate system. But then you also have you know, third party libraries that you might bring in PHP and you have to manage those as well. Yeah. Composer is all in one. It's, it's all about um, that philosophy of probably invented elsewhere. Some people have called it pie. Uh, the idea that, pull, uh, that the first choice that we should have when implementing something is to use someone else's code, someone else's project uh, maintained um, library, et cetera. And to truly embrace something like Pi, uh, we have to be, um, we have to make the idea of including other code um, a first class citizen um, of our projects and not the exception. That's right. And Composer is what lets us do that. So sort of um, to dive in, I uh, sort of the way that you actually end up using Composer as a technology is that you get it installed um, on your system. It's a command line tool. And um, this is something that is really helpful for 
you know, obviously assembling components to your website, but also for even managing tooling that you might want to use to develop your website. For example, our Terminus command line tool for Pantheon is actually a composer project. That's how you, you know, install it on your local machine, and that's how you keep it up to date. Um, and so having a development environment that includes Composer is a, I think, necessity in this day and age. And what Composer is sort of doing for you is it's more or less sort of building or assembling this set of rules around what you actually want to have in your project. And this is all governed by a composer.json file, which uh, exists in the sort of root of your project. So this is just a quick example um, from a site I'm going to show you in just a minute. Uh, this is something we have a quick tool to set up, so it should be pretty nice to, to see. But it's basically a you know, manifest of sorts to tell you sort of what versions of um, different PHP projects or Drupal modules or Drupal itself that you need. So there's a lot of complexity here, but like unlike a Drush Mate kind of solution where like you're ultimately responsible for sort of editing and changing this code, this composer file is actually automatically generated by running composer. So if you wanted to like, you know, require a, like include a module, you could do something like this, composer require Drupal panels to actually bring down that panels uh, module, as well as all of its dependencies. It's another really great piece about Composer is that Composer is smart. It knows that if you're asking for panels module, aside from a lot of magic and really good excellence, you're also going to want chaos tools module as well, um, as well as other dependencies. And that, that is sort of even on an inherited basis what can happen. So you're, you know, by requiring top line things, um, you can make sure to get all of the different pieces of information that you need um, there. In terms of uh, also, in terms of handling updates to that, if I was to go ahead and you know include the panels uh, module, or in this case, let's see, I actually have um, uh, the config direct save module installed already, and what happens with updates is that Composer will, will store the sort of, uh, you know, mainline sort of branch or uh, a sort of versioning system that you're on. And you can peg it to individual releases. So if you just want this particular, you know, release, you can have that. But a lot of times you're going to, you know, have it set up so that you can actually do updates. And so if uh, you run this command, so Composer require, adds the package to your project, and Composer update updates the package for your project. So your process of updating your modules becomes basically running Composer update. And the great thing is that works not only for Drupal or WordPress core, but also plugins and modules, as well as third-party libraries. It's a sort of like one, one command to update it all, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> And Composer likes to lock in those versions uh, right into its lock file, which determines the exact uh, snapshot down to the uh, individual release that's being installed and often the hash of the data uh, that's being installed into the project. And it doesn't actually touch that unless you do something like Composer Update. Uh, inst installing additional dependencies with something like Composer Require uh, does not actually uh, manipulate the, uh, the versions of anything else in your project unless it absolutely has to. Yeah, and that's because you're going to, when you're developing, obviously you want to peg to specific kinds of projects with specific versions, you know, new updates can have stuff that break, um, that, that break things. So you want to sort of treat updates like, you know, like code development, but it's something that definitely is, uh, is sort of possible. Um, in this case, I just ran Composer update and uh, we actually noticed that Drupal core uh, has an update um, to it. Uh, 8.3.1 uh, came out yesterday. Actually, has a pretty important security issue. Critical, but not highly critical. Yeah, you know, I mean, no Drupal getting style style here, but yeah, um, certainly something we want to update. And updating like this is is there. One, I think, important gotcha for using Composer, especially on Pantheon, is that we offer this like automatic update option for your site. 
as you're probably um, familiar as a uh, as it goes. And this is something that I think you know. I'd be curious your thoughts, David, in terms of how they play together. But Pantheon offers updates like this when you have a new version of Drupal. Composer can also take in new updates. Like, how would you handle sort of both those two kind of features? A lot of it depends on what kind of upstream that you want to be working with. Uh, in the case where you're working with an individual site, uh, then it probably makes sense to handle it almost all through Composer, because Drupal 8 uh, ships its own Composer manner. Difficult to try and uh, double up and compete with Drupal's own changes with Composer data. Uh, there is a plugin um, maintained by uh, Wikimedia for, uh, I think, for a lot of the media wiki needs that allows you to sort of um, merge Composer manifests. But the uh, in the general case, um, you you probably want to just only have one group working with Composer. You either want your upstream to be working with Composer, or you want to be working with Composer, um, and. Uh, the way that we handle these upstream updates on the platform is via tracking things with Git. So we're, we're tracking the underlying bytes that are committed to the code, which is a different level of tracking than, um, uh, than Composer typically does with the Composer JSON files. It's almost like um, tracking at the same level that Composer lock files would be. So uh, as a rule of thumb, um, wherever you're committing your um, Composer lock file is where you should be using Composer. Uh, and uh, you probably shouldn't be cloning things and copying things over multiple repositories, w including a Composer lock file, unless there are no downstream things happening with Composer. Um, so basically, you want to run Composer either just directly on a site, uh, because you want to run manage that complete project with Composer, or you might want to use it with an upstream on Pantheon, and then all the downstream sites just use the exact code that's being generated by Composer. And then that way, uh, there's only one place that actually has to merge changes into the composer.json. Yep, that sounds like so. It sounds like good advice for sure. Um, and and that's sort of that's sort of the way that it ends up working. You have a project that you use to uh, with composer. That means you're going to have a composer JSON file and a composer lock file, and you sort of manage those to work with your projects. Um, and I think in the world of Drupal, that's something where Drupal 8, you get it ships with Composer JSON, Composer lock files. You can sort of overwrite those um, if you want. Um, and then in the case of WordPress, you can sort of set, up, set those up that way um, to use it. In, because Composer can track any PHP project. Uh, it's, a, it's a very versatile tool in that respect. So if you're interested sort of in this kind of stuff, one of the, we have a few tools we'd like to point you to and maybe do some demos of just to give, uh, give a little, little color for today. Um, you know, I feel a lot of people might be a little, a little green with their composer knowledge um, just because it is sort of new and if you're not working on a project with it, I think this is a good place to sort of start a nice like greenfield kind of, uh, kind of development. And this is this uh, example drops a composer um, repo. So this is a this is a, uh, our colleague Greg Juan Anderson, who's a uh, who's an expert, who's uh, in all of this, has basically given this as sort of an example. You want to go try using Composer on Pantheon? This is a really great place to start because it offers you sort of two ways to actually use uh, Composer. So the first way, which I can sort of show off right now, is using Composer in a sort of Pantheon standalone development pattern, which means that you use probably, as most of you are doing, you have Pantheon as your development platform, you have a local checkout of your code, and you want to use Composer to sort of manage all of that. And so the way that you sort of set this up is you have a site. Um, you, this is for a new site. So you create a new site um, with Drupal 8, let's say. And then you actually overwrite the like upstream repo that's being got with the code that Greg's got here. So you're actually um, creating, you create a, pro a project from the example drops, it drops a composer repo. You uh, run this composer prepare for Pantheon command that actually sets all of this, this stuff up. 
and then you get it, get create a Git repository, add the uh, code to it, and push it on over Pantheon. And this allows you to actually have a sort of you know Drupal 8 site on Pantheon that's set up already with the composer stuff that you need. And I've actually gone ahead and done that uh, with um, with with my repo right here. And the stuff that's going to be obviously a little different than what you're maybe used to is that we're actually using a, a doc root. So this is the we have a dot, a dot web directory that actually has the um, the website. That's something if you haven't sort of seen it on Pantheon, you can use a web doc root as a part of your YAML file, which actually is pretty cool. Um, and you also have, of course, the composer JSON and the composer lock files uh, set up there. Greg's also gone ahead and sort of, you know, in terms of, uh, and we'll get into a little bit of this later, but he's also set up a configuration directory um, so you and a circle.yaml so you can run this continuous integration environment. Um, and then there's also this, well, this vendor directory, which in the composer world is really important because any of the custom code that you have is actually going to live in sort of the web directory. Um, but when you start to talk about Composer, it's actually bringing in a lot of other people's stuff. And sort of the vendor directory becomes where a lot of that kind of stuff is stored. Um, and so this is by sort of, sort of author name. So Wikimedia has this Composer merge plugin that David was mentioning. So that code is actually available in the vendor directory. And that's something that sort of that's where all of the different other people's code um, is, is managed. And what happens is that like I've just got this checked out here on my site. I can of course you know do local development um, on this, and uh, it'll like you know we have a, it comes with a git ignore that'll um, you know ignore the stuff that doesn't need to be pushed to Pantheon, and then I can actually start to do things like. Um, uh, like require the, the panels module, like I was mentioning before. And this is actually going to go ahead. You'll see here that it's found panels uh, version 4 beta. It's updating my composer JSON to reflect that I've got that new, um, uh, new, new project. And then it'll just go make sure that I have any, uh, any of the dependencies and make sure those are all, all sort of squared away. So if you're used to using like a Drush DL module, or using the sort of WordPress UI to pull down a plugin, like this becomes your replacement for, for getting that code. In fact, you should always use this to get other people's code. You want any code that you want to manage externally in your Composer JSON. Um, and this, of course, works for both Drupal and for external things, maybe through Packagist, uh, so that you can integrate arbitrary PHP libraries, arbitrary things from, say, Symfony, and arbitrary things from the, the world of Drupal. Um, and that, this also allows Drupal projects to pull in dependencies like that as well, especially if you're using these sorts of merge tools. Um, uh, and there's been major changes with support for this um, on Drupal.org um, with the release of official support for Composer package availability for all Drupal modules and other assets on, on Drupal.org. It no longer requires that sort of mirror or proxy service um, but actually it's gotten wound down. Yep. So Dr uh, Drupal has first class support for Composer and a lot of WordPress uh, stuff is also supported um, through Packagist and other systems. So you can get the projects that you need brought into your, your situation. Like in this case, we installed this panels module. It also, of course, brought us C tools. And then I can go ahead and do a you know, panels and C tools modules commit. Um, and then, you know, I can still work locally. I can maybe do some additional development. Um, I can, um, you know, do any other things I want. In this case, I'll pull down. I think I made a change earlier to my site. Uh, I think I brought, I think I did the devel module earlier. And then I can go ahead and assuming that's all set up, I can go ahead and, and push that module, module up to my development site on Pantheon. Um, oh. And get it up there. Um, the uh, the the other way, and that's using that's using Composer locally. Um, I may have a sort of faulty checkout there, but the other way I can show you to do Composer is actually running the Composer on Pantheon as a system, 
where you actually can use a additional Terminus plugin we've developed called um, Terminus Composer plugin to run Composer on Pantheon. Um, and that's something that actually can be really helpful for, for your use case because then you can actually run you know, Composer in a multi-dev environment, in a Pantheon environment uh, directly. So this is something where you have a few different um, options here to actually do, do things, but what you're really trying to do is, compo ter is Terminus, Composer, okay, well to get it installed actually, should back up. You go into the, uh, the Terminus directory and then you make a plugins directory if you don't already have it. And that's where you're gonna need to install um, the build tools plugin if you want to use Greg's scaffolding to set up sites and the Terminus Composer plugin to use Terminus. And if we go ahead and do Terminus Composer, we then can give it a site name. So Composer Magic Site Dev. And then what we can do is just run that. And this is actually going to use a connect a sort of SSH tunnel to the PHP container on Pantheon. It's then going to run um, Composer and that composer is going to, you know, have all the different options for the site that we saw. So, so we can go ahead and require Drupal panels to bring that down on on the the Pantheon site directly. And that's something that um, we'll sort of be executing right here in the system. So you'll see it'll do the same thing we just did before, but. In this case, it'll actually be able to um, uh, sort of add, it'll add the items here. Now it needs to be added under SFTP mode because it needs writeability to the particular environment. You'll see here, it's just changed the composer.json file right now where you see it add, it's added panels, but it's also found of course C tools and, um, and some other stuff. And uh, it actually went ahead and, and added that. So 234 files are changed and now I can call it panels and C tools module. And now I've actually gone ahead and added those to my project. And that's pretty cool. Like that's a you know really easy way to sort of do it. Um, I think I would definitely specify sort of one one way if you're going to work on work on Pantheon SFTP mode or work um, locally. Um, otherwise, you get that sort of some of the, the errors I was getting with with pushing code. But um, but if the site has multi-dev, it's possible to have some people on some environments using SFTP and some people working remote, and it should still harmonize properly with the composer data over Git. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, and that's a good, you know, a good kind of thing. Everybody sh could can be responsible for sort of pushing up their individual changes and kind of stuff that they sort of want to have happen. But it is worth getting used to uh, the resolution methods for Git conflicts if you have multiple people editing composer JSON. Um, or causing changes to happen because even an adjacent a change to an adjacent line in the same file is still going to cause Git to want you to manually resolve the uh, integration. Yeah, um, and that's something that like is managing merge conflicts is definitely uh, you know an issue. Like in this case, like I tried to push it before locally, you saw, and it didn't work. That's because I had like already installed the devl module to the site. And then we went. I went ahead and tried to install the panels module. So now it's actually going to show me that I have some merge conflicts um, in composer.json and composer.lock and vendor uh, composer installed.json, um, which you know is because I've added a couple different um, modules and it doesn't know how to reconcile sort of those those two. Um, or actually, I guess it does know how to auto merge it, um, but it had a conflict initially. And then I had to put it together. And sometimes you will run into like conflicts that cannot be auto merged because the same file is being changed by multiple people. But that's okay. Manage usually it, it can automatically merge together. And if it can't um, do it, like in this case for Composer JSON, I guess the auto merge failed. You can go in and the actual um, the actual sort of sort of work to to, to reconcile that's not very much, right? Because it doesn't actually matter which, which order it's in, so I can just. Probably, probably I would say best practice around managing changes on the team making things with Composer is that uh, multiple team members should not independently be running Composer update um, because that can, that will completely update anything in the project within constraints that can be and update all the lines 
that need to get changed in Composer Lock. And if different people do that at different times, then they're going to be pegged to different versions of components. Yeah. So in general, what you would want is people doing feature or bug fix work to try and only add the things they need to Composer, maybe update a couple things if they absolutely need it for, say, bug fixes or other reasons. But otherwise, try and avoid doing Composer update on a branch by branch basis. Uh, what you would want is to create an environment um, in, say, multi-dev that is a composer update freshening yeah. of everything, and then treat it as a unified um, approach uh, that's coordinated across the team of this is the branch and this is the merge that's going to freshen uh, the, the locks in general, because you can run into lots of conflicts, and what you really don't want is a conflict where one person is depending on one version and one person is depending on another, and uh, the code will only, each person's code will only work with the specific version they've pegged it to because that's actually not reconcilable uh, without further development work. Yeah, that's, that's a really great point. I think Composer Update is extremely powerful. I would treat it like doing a mass update to like all of your plugins and modules all at once, and Composer makes that even a little more tricky because of that JSON file, and doing an approach like David mentioned I think would be really, really valuable um, for folks. Um, and if you're just a solo developer, you know, just like, you know, make sure everything's committed and everything's in a good place before you run it. Um, and be okay to like roll it back if it doesn't work the way you expect. It's a it's a power command. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, basically, like sort of using this kind of approach for Composer is a pretty good way to sort of you know do the standalone development. And it's something if you haven't played out with Composer, I think check out example drops a Composer, try to play around with it, and um, you know require a few modules, do a few updates, um, and then you know dive in a little deep with some of the Composer documentation. Um, there's definitely ways that when you, you when you run composer require, for example, you can um, you know require specific kinds of versions or branches. Sometimes modules or plugins have a 2x branch and a 1x branch. Require lets you specify which one. It can let you specify if you want to run a dev branch um, or the or a main release. And just understanding that syntax is really helpful. You can even pin it to specific commits. Or yeah, or specific commits, which could be very helpful, especially on a especially if there's been a release and they've committed a bug fix to something necessary. Um, yes. The uh, the other piece that I think is I would be be happy be happy that I didn't mention is that one of the things that I think if you're used to using Drush Make or um, uh, or having a workflow where you're using a lot of patches to individual projects is that, you know, in Drush Make, you just have, like, you know, require panels module, and then right below it, you're like, apply this patch. Like, it's pretty straightforward. Composer actually doesn't natively support that kind of workflow. So, um, uh, see, Wiggins has a nice little Composer patches plugin for Composer, Composer's pluggable, that allows you to actually do what you're used to doing. So, you're going to have to, like, do a little, um, I think you either have to edit the Composer JSON or use the, use the command he's got. But it basically, the idea is you've already got, say, Drupal, Drupal installed right here as part of your Composer require, right? You see Drupal. Um, and then there's this extra patches kind of situation where you actually can say, for this particular project, add the following different patches. And then you can just specify the actual patch file on Drupal.org. And um, most upstream projects at this point are being managed with Git anyway. So you can always fork the project if you need to and apply the necessary patches, commit them if you have a more complicated modification uh, to something. And then um, I believe a Composer can install uh, via um, sources like Git as well, uh, in addition to using the, um, um, the repositories. Yeah, and this is something that like you're probably, especially in a sort of more you know, bleeding edge Drupal 8 kind of situation, going to end up doing a lot of this kind of you know, managing patches with Composer. And that's great, because you actually now have a really clean way to understand what's been changed, and then a way to keep that all in up-to-date and stuff like that. You're not like, did I apply some weird patch, and will it apply to other stuff? It's all right there in your Composer JSON manifest. More truth, beauty, and wisdom to you all for doing that. All right. So that's like sort of like piece one. Um, we're definitely going to do some questions uh, as well. The, uh, the only other sort of piece I wanted to show off is... Um, so one of, the way I was showing you was using standalone development where you're having developers run Composer 
uh, require, composer um, uh, update, and you know, you're sort of managing all of that code. <laughs> there is a way, and we'll be showing off some of this at the DrupalCon, where you can actually have <coughs> Composer be run not by any developer on your team, but by the robots in a sort of continuous integration solution. And so there's this other part of it where you're actually using, um, again, this Composer 8 repository, but using a pull request workflow on something like GitHub where you actually can set up your situation where you have a sort of, you know, site like this on GitHub where you've got your composer JSON file, but in the git ignore on the GitHub repository, you're actually ignoring the entire vendor directory. So like you can like require new code, but the only thing that actually will ultimately get pushed to GitHub is that composer.json and that composer.lock file. That any of the actual like vendor pull downs are not even going to be part of your Git repository. Like all you need to know is that you're running, like this is what you'll have to get the DevL module, for example. Like Drupal DevL. That's all. That's only code that you actually would need to push to 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 GitHub to show that. And then what happens is that you're sort of actually doing development on GitHub, so you're able to like do pull requests and and do commits and stuff like this. And that the sort of magic is that like every time you like do a pull request, you actually have integrated with a third party system like, um, like Circle CI, for example. And you're actually, when you actually do the, the commit, you're going to first do a sort of like, you know, get checkout of your code. And then you're actually going to do the composer install which is actually going to pull down the, do basically pull down all the stuff that's required. So if you've got Drupal Deval, Drupal Panels, and you wrote JSON, running Composer install will in fact download all of those, create a vendor directory, and then you actually push that code back to Pantheon. So the actual process of managing Composer to create that, we call it a build asset, is something that happens entirely on, um, uh, in the continuous integration solution. And that's really nice because you're then not like having any individual person responsible for that. That's just something that happens um, automatically. And it's also subject to like, you know, a variety of different testing. You'll see we've got some DHAT testing and visual regression testing. So this is something we'll be showing off at DrupalCon and doing, you know, we have a WordPress version of this as well. We'll be talking more publicly about. But, um, you know, one of the cool pieces of Composer is that you can use Composer as part of this larger workflow where you have code on GitHub that just contains the Composer JSON and maybe like your SAS or coffee script. And then when you actually go ahead and like close a pull request, it'll run the Composer install, it'll run the SAS compilation, it'll run the coffee script assembly, and then it'll push all of that as a build artifact to Pantheon and allow you to work that way as well. And all of this is possible with upstreams as well. All of these things um, in terms of the hooks around uh, Quicksilver or these automations, the idea of creating a minimalist um, Git repository, if you want to have that sort of lean basis for projects, uh, can be done with upstreams on, on the platform uh, as part of the agency tool set. Uh, and then um, that can facilitate each individual site having a uh, wide breadth in terms of working with um, the composer-based workflows. Yep, and that's a great way to go. Um, in terms of some additional resources, we're going to take a few questions. And of course, add any questions that you have to the questions uh, webinar situation. But we have um, uh, we have this sort of uh, docs page on Composer, pantheon.io slash docs slash Composer, that runs over a lot of the links and stuff that, um, that we have. So, you know, information on how to set up this kind of stuff um, using, um, using other code bases, how to actually, like, you know, create custom, um, custom packages. So, you know, for WordPress, you want to include your own custom plugin that you've just written and have a, up on sort of a GitHub somewhere. Um, same thing for um, how to actually use sort of remote composer with that composer plugin that I had and um, some resources for using it with Drupal and WordPress are down here. So docs slash composer is probably your go-to if you're like interested in what we're talking about and want to play around more with it. This is the page you want to be looking at and install the Terminus Build Tools plugin and work that way. Um, and then, um, and then the uh, the of course uh, 
the example drops a composer repository will let you get up and running quickly. But I would say in general, like Composer is a pretty cool tool to manage other people's code. It's definitely the standard in the PHP community to include this kind of stuff. And it's supported on Pantheon with PHP for PHP stuff for Drupal and, and WordPress. So we think um, we're seeing tons more people use this every day with their projects. We believe this to be the sort of de facto standard. Um, and we hope that you try your next project uh, using Composer. Uh, with that, maybe we can, uh, we can go to some questions and you know, chat a bit more about what folks want to see or questions they have about using Composer. All right, we're going to jump right in here. We have quite a few questions to get through. Submit anything you have now. Uh, the first question is, uh, is there a purpose to require dev here? My gripe with Composer is this step takes forever compared to, say, Drush make usage. Yeah, so I think one thing sort of that Composer does do is it takes um, some time um, to run certain kinds of things. And that, that can be a little bit annoying, partially because it's doing a lot of dependency checking. It's pulling down sort of packages and stuff. But it does do a certain level of caching around it. Um, so one of the things that you, sort of, you can sort of see when you're doing, um, you're using it in a sort of continuous integration situation is you often want to have Composer in a sort of cache directory kind of thing, so you only download it once. Um, there also are, uh, there's like a couple things you can do to actually speed it up. Um, there's like a, there's another Composer package that's actually designed to make Composer faster. Um, it's, um, uh, I think it's uh, this consolidation um, Composer Global Require. But and, that, and that can help just do it, do, can get stuff required quicker. But another way to get it to run really quickly is to do it on the server side with um, the SFTP mode, commit it there. And rather than um, running everything from your local desktop and making possibly thousands of requests to different servers, pulling down all these different assets individually, uh, it can pull it from a data center, which is going to have um, you know, 100 or even 1,000 times as much access speed to other um, key resources in the web, pull all those things down. Uh, and then um, once it's committed to Git, um, pulling through Git for local development and switching back out of SFTP mode for a project um, would allow you to um, have it all delivered as like compressed Git snapshots, which is going to be far faster than making all of the requests for all the different assets that Composer wants to pull down. Yeah. And that could, only, that could be used just to just bootstrap a project um, and save a bunch of time initially, uh, or it could be used um, with the sort of automation flow that um, Matt was talking about with um, Quicksilver, where um, if you automate the runs of these builds on the server side and only really work with uh, the Composer manifest um, on the client side, then um, you rarely have to run the builds on your local machine. Uh, one note on our current question from a viewer is uh, composer.lock also skips the step of Composer loading all the versions and just loads the spe specified asset version. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yep. All right, moving on to our next question from our friend Sean. Um, is it best practice to run Composer update on its own for your whole Drupal project? That was best practice to update individual components separately. It is probably better to update the individual components. Uh, uh, the advice I was giving was if you want to update everything, you probably don't want people doing that separately, independently on their own branches. You probably want to coordinate that project-wide. Uh, but that said, it's probably best to be more selective, to see what updates are available, um, apply them a little more surgically um, in terms of um, this branch is going to be updating these modules or libraries, committing that, merging that, and I mean, testing it and merging it um, rather than updating the whole project at once. Uh, and then that way you can avoid too much of developers stepping on each other's feet. Yeah, I mean, of course, you're going to want to deal with, you know, I think Composer will handle the dependencies for you because you're updating, if you're updating panels module, like, you might also want C tools module updated as well to, like, truly sort of test that update just because they often depend on each other. Um, but I think, you know, Composer update is a powerful thing. It runs a lot of different code and, you know, having more s surgical updates can help you sort of identify problems quicker. And you can always, com uh, 
do surgical update after surgical update and eventually get all the updates done. Um, it just it depends on the approach the project wants to take. Um, I would say the more developers, the more branches, the more features in flight, the more it makes sense to do it take a surgical approach and periodically review what updates need to get done. Um, and then it may even make sense to assign as um, a project for someone to do um, to update specific subsets of the project uh, where um, you might notice that there are security updates available for three of your modules, um, and then um, you might want to assign that to someone to only perform the security updates necessary for the project rather than updating everything. Yep. All right, next question. Uh, can you discuss more about the upstream use case in which the upstream has a composer.json file, but then also the downstream site wants to use composer to track its own dependencies? Is this possible? Uh, yes. Um, if you want to update the composer um, set up on the downstream area, what I would recommend is you don't want to come to commit uh, to commit the composer lock file in the upstream. You want to only have the composer JSON, and then that provides the foundation of the project. And the uh, merging changes for composer JSON, if there are changes to the upstream, is generally going to be cleaner because it's a kind of high level specification. Uh, rather than updating the composer lock file, which could change any subset of the lines in the file and create a lot of conflicts. Um, the, um, if you have a, an upstream that just has composer JSON and maybe a Pantheon YAML in it, um, then uh, it's sort of a way to bootstrap your projects rather than a, a directly installable um, um, upstream. Um, but there's nothing wrong with that. Up upstreams don't have any assumptions over whether they are fully installable or not. Yeah. All right, next question. What are your suggestions for updating core when you have modules installed with composer required? Well, um, the, um, the Wikimedia um, composer merge is one approach you can take, uh, where that is a tool that allows you to have multiple composer JSON files that all get amalgamated for um, seeing which um, things need to be pulled down to the project without merging all the changes, uh, without manually compiling all the changes into one composer.json. Uh, that's one way to do it. Um, another way is to um, is to manually continue to compile that composer.json file and accept that when upstream changes things, assuming you're using um, the full kind of Drupal upstream that ships with the full composer.json, you will have to resolve conflicts if you've altered any of the dependencies that Drupal has also altered. Um, do you think that gets it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. Uh, our next question looks like a troubleshooting question. Um, I've had a few mysterious situations where I've gotten weird errors in Drupal after using composer remove for certain modules that I no longer needed, and I end up having to remove the vendor directory and then run composer install to get everything back in sync. Are there any troubleshooting tools to, deter to determine what uh, the problem is when things somehow get out of sync? I, s I believe that Composer Remove may only remove the dependency listing from the Composer JSON and not actually clean up the vendor area. Um, I, I have to I have to try it to see, but that may explain why that sort of situation would happen because Drupal tries to do a lot of auto discovery of what modules you have available. It doesn't. Drupal doesn't actually look at the composer JSON file to see whether a module is intended to be included with the site. Yeah, that makes sense. The, uh, are you try, trying? I was going to try to remove one, but it's got a merge conflict. <laughs> um, you can always just pull force and just like squash your local stuff. Yeah, fix the conflict too. Yeah, that also <laughs> works. Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes you sometimes things <laughs> do get a little crazy. Um, and I believe we have a follow-up to our last question, um, if we're okay moving on. And that is, would an upstream that consisted solely of a composer.json file work if it, need, if it needed to include dependencies that are only available via a private Git repo? Could Pantheon actually build the site in that case? Does that require a private Git repo? Yeah, there's... Um, um... I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know off the top of my head the answer to that one. Um, 
So you can even you can define yeah you can definitely use a custom repo. I don't there the syntax. He's asking for a private one where it requires credentials. Yeah, yeah yeah yeah. There's under the source. So like check if you sort of um, check out this kind of custom code where you're sort of defining the source URL type and reference. I'm going to guess that either you could just pass credentials in the URL itself, um, like set up a user with just read access, or there might be some additional options you can put in there. Yeah, there are no, uh, I'm not aware of any approach that is supported on the platform if you really, really need to keep the code super private in the sense of not putting credentials anywhere into Git, uh, even, even on Pantheon. Um, this would be more of a way to protect a little bit of the source that you're working with if you don't want to release it more than truly keeping secrets. Um, if, you're, if you want to do secrets management, um, I, <laughs> excuse me, I wouldn't do it through this sort of system. Uh, there are key management approaches, including um, some of the stuff that we've done with, say, Locker. Yeah. Um, if you want to, say, um, embed keys into, or to deploy keys with a project to access external services like SendGrid, uh, so I wouldn't try to pull that through Composer um, or protect those sorts of things with um, private repositories. Um, but at the same time, I'm not 100% sure whether um, you can throw the credentials right into that repo thing. Um, the, uh, let's see, um, another, let's see. I'd, have to, I'd probably have to experiment with that to really come up with a comprehensive answer for that one. Yeah, I'm gonna guess this. I'm gonna guess it's possible. I've not personally done that, but it, it sounds like a pretty common use case. Composer, and the good thing about Composer is that it's used very widely, well beyond Drupal. So if you have like, you know, in cases where you're like, oh well, all Drupal modules are public, like you wouldn't have anyone's need to be secret. Like that's not true. Probably it's not true in Drupal anyway, but it's not true um, across the PHP web. So a lot of use cases are really sort of like worked out pretty well. Um, it would also be possible using the Quicksilver integrations where if you're running Composer there uh -huh. um, and then pushing the data back, uh, if you say did it via Git with it, um, then it's possible to manage um, secrets and authentication data um, using that tool uh, and then not and then have it pulled off of pulled on a server but not on a server on Pantheon. All right, moving on to our next question. How do I manage updates to many sites, like 50 to 100 or, or more sites, which all use Composer to update? What can be scripted? Definitely scriptable. Uh, you want to yeah. take that one? Um, yeah, I mean, so I think, like, similarly to how you could, you know, do a Terminus script to update um, 50 sites by, like, applying, like, Terminus upstream update, for example, if you've got the build tools plugin installed, uh, or the, excuse me, the Terminus Composer plugin installed that you can just run through your 50 sites and instead of calling Terminus Upstream Apply, call Terminus Composer Update and that'll offer you the same kind of, of updatability. All right. And a follow-up from our last question. Um, there are a few ways that other CI services have handled it. Private file uploads, provo.ci, custom environment variables, Bitbucket pipelines, Encrypted values in the uh, YML file, Acquia pipelines. Just a note. There you go. Thank you, Sean, for that. Um, the Calibox question? Uh, there was a Calibox question, and that is, I'm building a site using Calibox and Pantheon. Uh, can I use Composer out of the box locally and push to devil? Do you level? Um, yeah, so the, the answer here is yes. Composer, uh, Calibox supports Composer um, on the sort of command line, not in the GUI. So you have to run uh, KBox Composer, and that'll give you full access to run Composer. And his follow-up was, I'm currently using the CalBox GUI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so you run KBox Composer to actually get it into your code base, and then you can use the GUI to do a push, uh, to push to Pantheon. But the Composer is the, is the command line tool. Uh, and on the CalBox train, the uh, next question is, does their Terminus Composer plugin okay. come with CalBox? Uh, I don't know if it comes with Cal... No, it doesn't come with Calibox because Calibox is running Composer locally as part of the Calibox suite. Um, and then that, that pushes to, to, uh, uh, to Pantheon. It would be possible to include the, um, 
the composer plugin with Calibox, but then you would do like a Calibox or Kbox Terminus composer, and then that would just run on the Pantheon system. Right. I'm going to try and run as, through as many of the questions as we have left in the time we have left. Uh, that next question is, is there a way to use a custom composer repository in order to use Composer to manage custom modules that are not in packages.drupal.org slash uh, 8? Yes, there is. Um, doc slash Composer on Pantheon.io. Here's an example of doing it for WordPress. It's just some random GitHub. And then for Drupal, here's an example of doing it in Drupal. Um, and you can just, just add it that way. Right. Next question. We are about to release a custom D8 distro uh, as an upstream on Pantheon. What is the recommended approach at this point? The traditional remote repo for the upstream or via a composer? Also, are there any special considerations for install profile module dependencies versus composer? Um, so I would say one thing here is that especially with like distributions, like there's, there isn't like an stat, like there's a number of different ways to do this. Um, so that's something that I think, you know, you're not, there's, I'm not going to say one way is better than the other way. Um, there is... There's presets, I don't know. Um, there is the ability, if you have the distribution like on a Drupal.org kind of situation, where you could actually do something like this that will actually pull down a distribution directly from um, Drupal.org and install it as part of Composer. So if you're releasing a custom D8 distro, you can then pull it down this way if, on a public basis. Um, I think for doing it on on Pantheon, if you're sort of not doing it as sort of a public Drupal.org one, um, I think you know having a composer JSON for your distribution makes a lot of sense. You can then just run the updates uh, yourself and then push the sort of you know completed uh, completed build artifact to to uh, to your upstream, and then your sites can all inherit that. Uh, follow up from the same person. We use Composer to install commerce and uh, address locally, and now we can't update core from Pantheon console. Is this a common issue? Yes, yes. So this is a this is definitely a common issue. Composer is a way to manage other people's code. The Drupal, the Pantheon console update button is another way to manage other people's code, and you only need one. So if you're using Composer to update, uh, you know. Drupal core, just use it that, do it that way. You don't worry about our, 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 our situation. All right, next question. I have modules already on a site. Can I use Composer retroactively? Can I uh, start tracking the projects now? If so, how? I would go through with um, removing those modules and re-adding them with Composer, and then looking at, the, at reviewing the diffs and testing that out. Um, you should be able to get back to something very similar, but I wouldn't try to add it to a Composer config if it's already present with the files on the site. Um, the, uh, especially if it, if it installs it to a different location, like the vendor area, rather than where it might have manually gotten installed. Um, oh, let's see. Um, yeah, I would say um, uh, there is a tool that will generate a Composer manifest for an existing site, but I think you're probably better off trying to just just do it quickly. Um, if you've got even if you've got 50 modules, you can just do Composer require all of them, and then you'll you'll be back on the train pretty easy. Right. Next question. Composer is cool and all. Any roadmap for supporting Node package managers like npm or Bower? Um, not on Pantheon specifically, but I think the the where, where we're really seeing this kind of um, kind of stuff be useful is in if you are using sort of npm um, to build packages for sort of testing you could actually use a sort of ci solution where you're actually able to like you know install install bower or grunt or gulp or something and you can um, of course run those tools and commit the code and push it up to pantheon or run those tools on a ci system uh, about the only thing that you wouldn't be able to do with npm or bower is actually run it directly on the uh, on the on the pantheon server with uh, sfdp mode yeah exactly so like if you want to use if you want to use these tools to compile sas do that as part of a ci build staff push it all to pantheon and uh, you'll be uh, you'll be you'll be doing good Alrighty. Uh, our next question is uh, if we decide to use composer locally not upstream 
for each project, can we disable the update code button on the dashboard so someone doesn't screw it up? That's why we, rec we recommend, especially if you're an agency, getting setting up an upstream that has the assets you want. Uh, because as long as you have your own upstream, you choose when any update occurs and for what reason in terms of the, um, the Git upstream, um, the way that we have it set up on the platform. And um, that allows you to opt out of the entire path of, um, of using um, kind of the drop state repository as, as a basis. Um, the, um, in terms of other limitations, um, I'm not sure the uh, other ways I would choose to uh, does it change that if you if you if you force this repo over the over the or the master origin it will um, will it still try to update I'm not sure uh, because it looks for revisions that are missing but in the if it doesn't have a common base revision then it wouldn't know how to enumerate them yeah. so it may have a list of zero so it may be the case that if you do this push that it will not find any updates. Yeah, yeah, I would say, I think it's the case that if you sort of override the Pantheon upstream by using an approach like this, you won't get any updates anymore um, in the dashboard. Um, I would say, though, that, like, as more people use this on the platform, like, figuring out how to, like, turn on and off the updates is something that we're, we'll be thinking about on the product side uh, to prevent the kind of confusion that you can run into. All right, next one. Uh, maybe a silly question, but how does Gulp or Grunt fit into this workflow for a project with Composer? Uh, so I can answer that. Typically, the way we see this work is Composer is just one of a number of tools you use as part of your build step. So you'll use Composer to like assemble the modules and, 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 and external code you need. You need Grunt or Gulp to actually do some um, you know, compiling of, of CSS or, or JavaScript stuff. And then you'll end up with you know, a sort of build artifact, which is all of these things all, all, all together, the actual code the website will run. And that's where running a CI solution, where you run, um, or you do run some composer, composer install, and you run some SAS compilation, and you run some grunt uh, as well, is all um, is all part of that workflow. And watch, uh, check us out for we're gonna present this at DrupalCon, but also have um, do some webinars and other blog posts about about using putting all of that together as part of a workflow using GitHub, continuous integration, and Pantheon. Right, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, sorry we didn't get all your questions answered, but we will be sending this recording out, so you can always reply to that with any questions that didn't get answered. And if you have any additional feedback, you can always visit our Contact Us page. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope to see you for the next edition of Couch Coding. Have a great weekend, everyone.